The scripture reading for today is in, in Colossians uh, chapter 1, verses 9 through 14. <clears throat> for this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, <clears throat> joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transfer us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. I don't know if you've ever had the experience of being annoyed at yourself for forgetting something really important. Um, do it a fair amount. A recent example is that I, I met a guy at a pastor's conference who I had met several times before. Um, he goes to my kid's school. Um, our kids have kind of become friends. They invited us over to their house. We took a walk before dinner. We ate at their house. We hung around a while afterwards. A couple months later, it worked out that they were... Uh, around here and we had them over for dinner they came over our house so this is a guy that I had not just somebody I met one time and you should try to remember his name this is somebody who I had multiple conversations with who I saw and instantly recognized and also instantly forgot his name and I was with my dad at the conference and decided I was confident that his name was going to come to me so I decided I would go ahead and start introducing him, I was so sure that that name would come to me because there was no way I would forget it. So I started introducing him, introducing him to dad, and it came time to say his name, and I still didn't remember it. So he saw the blank look in my eyes and jumped in and introduced himself, and then I didn't see him. He was at that conference. I didn't see him the rest of the time. Maybe he you know, he just, he, I, I told myself he was probably avoiding me. He probably really wasn't. But you've probably had that experience where you've forgotten something really obvious that you should have known. Um, I'm hoping you've had that experience and I'm not the only one. Just something where you just can't believe you forgot it, you know. Like, could be something like your, your car keys or something you were supposed to do at work or a homework assignment. Just totally slipped your mind, but you were supposed to know it. You were supposed to remember it because it's a pretty common experience. We, pretty, we forget things pretty easily and pretty often. But more than just random things in life, like names and responsibilities and tasks that we're supposed to do, we forget the most important things. Um, Peter talks about this in 2 Peter and he, he starts with this list of things in our life as Christians that we're supposed to be doing. Um, he says, with all diligence, in your faith supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness. There's some lists like this in the New Testament, and you read through them, and you think, oh man, I don't really know if I'm doing very good on these. Um, and, and our typical thing is to think, well, Paul says, with all diligence, oh, I need to be more diligent in working on patience, working on godliness, working on self-control, more knowledge. Yeah, I should be more diligent in those things. But Peter, in this text, gives us kind of a, a surprising reason for why we don't have those things in our life. He says, he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted. And what does he mean by that? Having forgotten his purification from his former sins. It's possible for us as Christians 
who know our salvation, we know what it means to be saved, to forget how amazing our salvation really is. That's the diagnosis. Not try harder, not do different things, although we do need to try harder probably, we do need to do different things, but at the root of it is that we've forgotten that we were purified from our former sins. Our text this morning is actually in Colossians, and it's, it's a similar text in the sense that Paul is writing it to Christians. Paul writes to this church in the city of Colossae that in this church is doing pretty well. Um, this isn't like Galatians, Pastor Chuck's been preaching through that, or the Corinthian church. Man, they had some bad problems that Paul's like, look, I don't even know what you guys are doing here. This is a church that Paul writes to, and he really has almost all good things to say about it. And he's in this opening uh, chapter, he's giving his heart. Basically, he's giving to the Colossians how he prays for them. Um, He wants three things for them. In verses 9 through 10, he wants them to be filled with the knowledge of his will. In verse 11, that they would be strengthened with all power. And then in the text this morning, he's praying that they would be joyously giving thanks to the Father. So here's another kind of list, like in 2 Peter, where we look at those things and say, do I want to be filled with the knowledge of God's will? This isn't like his will about like which job should I take or where should I go to college or um, you know, what, what, should I, what should I do next Tuesday. This is the revealed will of God in the scriptures that we want to be controlled by that. We want to be filled with that. Um, do we, would you say that in your life, you, with you, in your Christian life, you wish you had more power? I think we would all say, yeah, we wish we had more strength and more power to do the things that he's called us to do. Or we would say, do we need to have more joyful thanksgiving? Absolutely. So then Paul says, here's how you get it. Here's how you get those characteristics to be overflowing and abundant in your life. It's Colossians 1 verses 13 and 14, the the very next thing he says, for, he's connecting it to joyously giving thanks, he rescued us from the domain of darkness, transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So this morning here in our text, I just want to give you three reminders about your salvation. They are reminders that we need because a lot of times we have forgotten them. We have forgotten what we were saved from, we've forgotten who it is that saved us, and we've forgotten what we were saved to. So first, it's very easy for us to forget what we were saved from. Paul describes to these Christians that they used to be in the domain of darkness. This word domain here is the word for power or authority. That has the idea of having the right to rule. And normally when this word appears in the scriptures, it's the domain of Satan. But here Paul just says the domain of darkness, which I think he's really just broadening it out to include sin and Satan. But in other words, without Christ, we are under the authority of sin and Satan. Sin and Satan were calling the shots in our life. It wasn't that we weren't making wrong choices still, and it wasn't that our, uh, we weren't responsible for the wrong choices that we were making, but our true condition is that we were underneath the power of sin and Satan. The Bible's words that are used to describe us without Christ are always serious words and desperate situations. In John 14, Jesus says that we are orphans without him. In 1 John 2, it says that we're blind. In Ephesians 2, it says that we're dead. And in Romans 6, it says that we're slaves. So in all of, these, in all of those word pictures, it's describing our, our helplessness, right? It's describing a situation that you cannot free yourself from. This is our true condition without Christ. In 1969, the rock and roll icon Jimi Hendrix was kidnapped. 
He was um, kidnapped by two lower level mob guys who thought they could get some money for him. And that's actually not the most strange part or the most horrifying part of that situation because after a couple of days the higher ups apparently in the mob in Chicago found out what had happened and told those guys to release him they didn't want the heat of arresting this famous rock star but what actually makes that situation so sad is that Jimi Hendrix never knew that he was kidnapped he was tucked inside of an apartment for a couple of days and he was so high on drugs and alcohol that he never even knew what happened to him And that is a picture, I believe, of our state without Christ. It wasn't just that we were in a bad situation. It's that we were in a bad situation and we didn't even know it. Right? That's the problem. When you're blind, you you don't know what it looks like to see (laughs) to a certain extent. When you're dead, that's all that you know. And we, as children of Adam, were born into the kingdom of Satan. We were born in sin. So it's not just that we were in a bad situation. It's that we were in a bad situation and we didn't even know it. That's how bad it was. So I just want to take that that phrase that Paul reminds the Colossian church of and use it this morning to remind our church here. If you're here this morning and you know Christ, you've asked him to save you and you know that he has. Have you forgotten that there was a point in time in your life that you were under the domain of darkness? Now, there may be some time that's elapsed before you have to, you know, before, in order for you to go back in your mind and remember what that was like. And you may remember the, the bad choices and the consequences for your sin that you were living through back then. For some of us, it may not even be, you may not have a lot of memories of that time. If you were saved at an early age, You may not have had a a long history of rebellion and facing all those choices and consequences, but either way, it's the same. There was still a point in time in your life where you were under the authority of sin and Satan. And have you forgotten that? Has that part kind of started to just be assumed or slip into your memory so that it just doesn't really register with you anymore? Because if it has then your salvation has started to slip in its importance. So, have you forgotten where you were saved from? But second, as we look at this verse, I want to ask you, have you forgotten who does the saving? Have you forgotten who does the saving? Colossians 1, 13 and 14, For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The first part of our text, the the very first thing that Paul says here is that God rescued us. This, This word rescued or deliverer, it just means that we needed an outside party to step in. When we use this word rescue, it's always because you couldn't do it yourself, right? If someone's drowning the lifeguard steps in and we say the lifeguard rescued them if it was a serious enough situation that if the lifeguard hadn't jumped in that person wouldn't have been able to make it if a if a firefighter bursts into a burning building and grabs the person and runs back out we say they were rescued because they couldn't do it themselves right it wasn't just like a little kitchen fire where they started to get a little bit of smoke and they had to leave and call the fire department we didn't, you wouldn't call that a rescue A rescue is when you can't do it yourself. Someone from the outside has to step in. So Paul says God rescues us. And then he goes kind of going through the different members of the Trinity here. And then he says God's son redeems us. We've been translated into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So there's two really important words here, redemption and forgiveness. Redemption just means to be freed by ransom. It's the word that's used for a slave or a captive when a price is paid. And a, the redemption is just the, the purchase of someone's freedom. So again, it's very similar to rescue in the sense that somebody who needs to be redeemed can't redeem themselves. 
is a third party, is an outside agency that has to step in and make it possible for you to be set free. Um, this word redemption, we probably we don't use it that much. The idea comes up, you've probably seen in some movie, whether it's a comedy or a serious one about somebody that gets kidnapped and the kidnappers call with their ransom demands, right? It's got to be money in an envelope or money in a suitcase. You've got to drop it off at a certain time. And if you do all that the way you're supposed to, then this person will get set free. So that's the idea of redemption. Of course, we know that when it comes to our salvation, it wasn't money that was involved. There was no possible way that the, it was financial currency that was, that was needed. It says that we are redeemed with the blood of Jesus Christ. The only way that you could be rescued, the only way that you could be redeemed, was if Jesus died. His blood had to flow out of him. So our our redemption is costly. Our redemption was something that was accomplished by Jesus Christ. And if I could just maybe say a little bit more specifically, I want to say your redemption was costly. If you have asked Jesus to save you, it means that Jesus redeemed you. He bought you back. He paid the ransom that was necessary for you. So that's the first word, redemption. The second word of what Paul says here is forgiveness. Now we use the word forgiveness a lot more in our everyday speech than we do redemption. The problem with using the word forgiveness is that the way that human beings use forgiveness is a lot of times it's not really forgiveness. People will say, oh, okay, I forgive you. But then the very next time that they get mad at you, they bring that up again, right? And that's not real forgiveness. Forgiveness is the word for when a a failure has been pardoned, for it's the removing of offenses. And when we talk about God's forgiveness, it is pure forgiveness, All of our sins, all of the wrong things we've done have been washed away. All of our offenses have been taken out of the way. So, I think probably the people who I'm speaking to here this morning, you know what the word redemption means. You know what the word forgiveness means. Our danger is that we know what those words mean, but we don't think about what they mean when we say them. You read them maybe in a good devotional book that you're reading. You might read them and they come up a lot and the ideas come up a lot in the scriptures. Most of the songs that we sing talk about words like this, redemption, forgiveness. They're used in sermons. We'll use them with each other. And over time, those words start to lose their meaning. And and I just want to stop and remind us that these words capture for us the heart of who came to save us. That we were redeemed and forgiven, not as just an idea or a transaction out there somewhere, but that we were redeemed by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ himself paid the price for you. Jesus Christ himself pardoned you for your offenses against him. That's what the verse says, that in the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. So I just give you this word of warning that our, our, our danger as Christians is that we, we use these words and they come off of our, our lips so easily. We're used to handling them and seeing them that after a while they don't mean anything anymore. And I just want to stop and remind you who it is that forgave you. It was Jesus himself. What that means is, and I'll just make a real obvious point here, but I still think it needs to be said, that means it wasn't you, right? You weren't the one that saved you. We, we live in a world today that is constantly telling us that we are in the middle of everything, that we can do everything, and in our own sinful Uh, human pride, we want to save ourselves. We would like to be our own rescuers. We would like to be our own redeemers. We would like to be our own forgivers. 
But that is not the good news of Jesus Christ. That is not what our salvation is. Most people, and even oftentimes people inside the church, think that they can purchase their freedom, that they can purchase their good standing with God by some version of their own goodness. I'm better than a lot of other people. I come to church on a regular basis. I don't do a lot of other bad things, maybe even that you used to do. And so you do kind of religious good stuff, and you think, well, then I must be good. One kind of question that you can ask yourself is that when you know that you've done something wrong, when you sin by... by uh, some way that you know you've displeased the Lord, you haven't done what you needed to do, what do you run to? Do you run to your own goodness? Do you sit there and say, yeah, I did this wrong, but I do a lot of these other right things? Or when you sin, do you go to the redemption, the forgiveness that you have in Jesus Christ? Jesus is the one who died on the cross for your sin. There is no other way for you to be redeemed. There is no other way for you to be rescued. People are often giving their ideas about what's wrong with the church in America. People are often saying, oh, the church in America should be doing this and that, and then we would have no problems. The fact of the matter is, what the church needs is the people inside the church to be saved, to be rescued. Why are we so kind of casual towards Jesus? Why do we have this attitude towards our Savior of like, yeah, he's good and we say the right things, but our hearts aren't really moved by him? It's because we don't really believe that he rescued us. If you study the history of the church, the times that revival came into the church, it was when people inside the church realized they weren't actually saved. In, in the great awakenings in our country, both times there were actually ministers of the gospel that, had been, that had, were the, the pastors of churches that realized they were unconverted. They had been trusting in their own goodness. They had convinced themselves that they were better than a lot of other people and they were doing the right things and they were inside the church, so of course they were saved. And what had to happen is the Spirit of God had to convict people of sin and open up their eyes to the fact that they needed to be rescued. And so that's why I just, I always stop at some point in time in my sermon and say, just because you are coming to church, it doesn't mean that you've been rescued. In order to be rescued, you have to realize that you're in the domain of darkness. Sin and Satan have captured you. And then you have to come to the conclusion that the only way you can be saved is through Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ is the one who has redeemed and rescued you. So please don't ever assume that just because you're coming to church, oh, you've got it. You've got it made. That just because you're a nice person and you know some of the Bible stories and the Bible words, that you've got it taken care of. The way that you come into the kingdom of Christ is by realizing who it is that rescues you. Who it is that rescues you. It's Jesus Christ himself that rescues you and redeems you. And if you've never done that before, you can do that today. You can ask Jesus to save you. Because you can't save yourself. And he starts a whole new life for you. And that's my last point here. We easily forget what we were saved from. We really easily forget who it is that does the saving. But the last thing is, we very easily forget what we were saved to. Paul says that he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of of his beloved son. One of the problems that we have about our salvation is that we think that God rescued us and then he kind of leaves us out there like in a no man's land. 
somewhere in the gray middle, and now we're on our own. But you see here in this text, that's not what it says. It doesn't just say he rescued us from the domain of darkness, and that's it. It says he transferred us into a new kingdom. This is part of the reason why people don't come to Christ, why they don't call out and ask you, ask him to rescue them, because they don't want a new king. We, we want to be set free from sin and Satan. That's not good. We don't like that. But we're hoping that we could get set free from sin and Satan and then be our own kings. But that's not how it works. The way that it works is you get transferred out of the kingdom of darkness and you get transferred into the kingdom of Christ where Jesus is king, where Jesus is the boss. He's calling the shots. And, and a lot of people, if they're honest, they don't want that. They don't want Jesus to be the king of their life. They want to be the king of their life. But what it means for us as believers is that the new kingdom that we are in king. This is not this is not the kind of kingdom that you live in and the king is far out and you might get a catch a glimpse of him once in your life. In the kingdom of Christ, you have an ongoing relationship with the king. It, sometimes I think it's a little bit of a, um, a, a flaw that we, we forget in some of the imagery that we use. We miss the point uh, that we, we push it a little bit too far um, or it, the analogy just doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't work. Like somebody who is like kidnapped, if they get set free, then they might thank the people who helped negotiate their release once or twice, but that's it, Right? If you're down the shore and you start drowning in the ocean and then the lifeguard jumps in and rescues you, you'll probably tell them thank you. If it was some big dramatic rescue, there might be a ceremony where you go back and say thank you. Overall, you're probably going to be embarrassed that some 19-year-old kid with the summer job had to jump in and, and save you, right? It's not that you didn't get a new best friend that day, probably, right? If a firefighter jumps in to, has to break their way into your house and rescue you, you're going to be thankful. But chances are you're not going to be hanging out with that firefighter on weekends. So that whole idea of rescue, it doesn't capture the full picture of what it means to be transferred into the kingdom of Christ. Um, Paul says that, Paul says it this way in Galatians 2.20. And I think he does a good job here of describing what it means to live in the kingdom of Christ. He says, I've been crucified with Christ. So that's past tense, okay? He's talking about his salvation when, when he was united with Christ in his death and his burial and his resurrection. And then he says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. That's present tense. Right now, Christ is dwelling in Paul, but he doesn't even just leave it there. He has to take it further. And he says, the life which I now live, that's present tense. And in case we might be confused about if Paul is just talking in more like abstract spiritual terms, Paul says, the life which I now live in the flesh. So Paul's like, I'm saying right, right, right now. <laughs> he says, I live by faith in the Son of God. Typically, we think about faith in our salvation, right? That faith is when you trusted in Christ for the first time that he could save you from your sins, and that's true. But what Paul is saying is, the way I live in the kingdom of Christ right now is I'm trusting in Jesus right now. Well, and you might say, well, Paul, what is it exactly about Jesus that you have faith in, that you are counting on every single day? Paul says, who I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So Paul says, I am living every day in the strength of Jesus Christ. And specifically, what specifically about Jesus? That he loves me and he gave himself for me. Our salvation is not just a past event, it's also a present reality. Right now, that changes you. Right now, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are counting on Jesus to get you through the day. 
You are trusting in his love for you. Probably the best word that does capture this ongoing relationship that we have with God is is the idea of adoption in the Bible, right? If you go into an orphanage and you say to the orphans, you're free, you can go. You know, they can get set free from the orphanage, but they, they still don't have a home to go to. And that's not the, the Bible's idea of salvation, right? The Bible, of, the Bible idea of salvation is adoption. You stop being an orphan because someone comes into the orphanage and they adopt you. And that's what happened at your salvation, right? You get taken home. You get, you get brought into the family of God. The Apostle John says it this way in 1 John 3, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God. And then he says, And such we are. Present tense. Present reality. Right now, we are children of God. God didn't just call me his child one time when I asked him to rescue me. And then say, well, I'll see you later. I hope your life goes well. The Heavenly Father calls you His child. And that is evidence of what? His love. In other words, He loves you right now. It's a present reality. I love, it was John, remember, that when he writes his gospel, he just says, Whenever it's John that comes up, he just says, the one who Jesus loved. It's like he, do, he doesn't even bother giving his name. It, like this has become more precious and, and more of a core part of his identity than even his own name. That when he comes up and he's writing, he's not, not putting John, no, the one who Jesus loved. The very first thing that John saw about himself was that he was loved by Jesus. When John got up in the morning, I don't know if they had mirrors back then, but if they did, if he looked in the mirror, he saw somebody who Jesus loved. It was a present reality, or we could even say it was a present identity. The, the, it was, came to be a fundamental way that he viewed himself. So ask yourself the question, what are some of the first things that come into your mind when you think about yourself? What are the the main things about yourself that you focus on as true? Because our salvation changes our identity. It changes because we realize we weren't just rescued, but we were transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of Christ. And what is it like to live in the kingdom of Christ? Well, we're his kids. We are loved children of God. When? Every day. Every day. We were lost, but now we're found. We were blind, but now we see. We were dead, but now we're alive. We were orphans, but now we're adopted. We are children of God. And I think that a lot of times we have, got, we have forgotten who we really are in Christ. This is what I'm talking about when I say we're forgetting. Paul Tripp, he calls it identity amnesia. In other words, another idea of forgetting, right? We forget what it really means that we are loved by God, that we are children of God. And he says, if you have that, he says, identity amnesia always leads to identity replacement. When you forget your identity in Christ, you search for your identity in people and places and things. We are all prone to start looking at the things around us to shape us and give us an identity. To give us the the love and the acceptance the, the ways of thinking about ourselves that we need in order to get through the, through the day and through life. But we forget that, that God has given us an identity. God has told us who we are. We are loved by God. 
We are children of the King. So if you want to ask yourself how well you're doing at remembering that present identity that you have in Christ, ask yourself how thankful you are. This is the test case, and I get that straight here from Colossians, because this is what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, joyously giving thanks to the Father, for he rescued us from the kingdom of darkness. So thankfulness is kind of like the, it's the gauge, it's the the dashboard instrument on your life that tells you how much you're living in the reality of what God has saved you to. Um, I prepared this message, uh, or, you know, and wrote this part of the message earlier in the week before in the last couple of days. You've seen scenes in the news of hostages being released. Um, I grew up in watching, you know, back, I remember as a kid watching the evening news because pre-internet, there wasn't 24 news all the time. And they would have to pick, a, you know, just a few seconds. And, and there's always some kind of... Uh, kidnapping or hostage situation that's getting resolved uh, either through war and something, uh, you know, with a prisoner of war or maybe um, through some kind of political thing that's going on. Someone's being held captive for a while. And I remember as a kid, you know, you would see these scenes of these hostages that are getting released coming off the plane. And it was never hard to tell which ones were the hostages and which ones were the regular passengers, right? The hostages that are coming off of the plane, they have, you know, there's media around, there's family there to meet them, but there's this unrehearsed, unrestrained joy that's coming out of them. Sometimes, you know, you would see hostages that would kneel down on the ground and kiss the ground because they're finally in their homeland again. They're where, it, they're where it's safe. They're where it's meant to be. They're where they're true citizens of. And, and that's a good picture for us of what it means to be rescued. If we really are conscious of the fact that right now we have been rescued and brought into a new kingdom, that is a source of joy and thankfulness. There's other people that are getting off the plane, right? They're just going down the steps and going home. It's nothing. Why, why are they not filled with joyful thankfulness? Well, nothing happened to them. Nothing really changed for them. But for us, we realize that we are a rescued and redeemed people who now are living in the new kingdom that Christ has given to us where we know the king and are loved by the king. So thankfulness is the the way that we can see and the way that we are responding to what Christ has done for us. It's a source of joyful thankfulness that you have every single day. What you were saved from, who saved you, and what you were saved to stays the same from day to day. God doesn't change. Your position without Christ didn't change in the past. And the kingdom that God is calling you to hasn't changed. And who he is and knowing him. So it is a source of dependable joy that is available to you on a regular basis you know we just had thanksgiving and when you have thanksgiving you finally sit down to that meal and a lot of the times you know you're just if you were if you were strategic about it if you were smart about it you didn't eat so you made sure you were really hungry for that meal you hopefully you probably had a bunch of really good food and when you were getting ready to sit there and eat that food, you were thankful, right? Now you're probably hopefully thankful for bigger things in life too, but in that moment, you're thankful that you're sitting down to eat that meal. It's going to taste good. But now we're a couple of days into Thanksgiving, and I'm guessing we all have Thanksgiving leftovers in our refrigerator, and now you're looking at it and you're like, I'm not sure I can eat that again. <laughs> I've eaten that for like three days in a row, and it's, it's starting to, you know, I'm not a, how long are you supposed to still eat it after it's in the fridge, right? That source of thankfulness is temporary and changing. But the joyful thanksgiving that we have because of our position in Christ, it does not change. 
Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Tomorrow, when you wake up, you have an opportunity to stop and just be thankful for what God saved you from, for who it was that saved you, and for what he saved you to. You have that available to you. As we close, i just give one final illustration of this. Some of you might know the, the name of Adniram Judson. He was the, one of the first missionaries to leave from America and take the gospel overseas. Um, Sarah has been reading his uh, biography to the Golden Shore, which is fantastic. You should definitely read it. Um, and she told me this story from, from it. I wanted to include it because I think it gives us, it, it gives this, this idea of what it means to make this a part of your identity and, and a part of your thinking on a daily basis. But anyway, the, the story with, with Adoniram Judson is he, he left in the early 1800s to go to the other side of the world in Burma, which is today um, uh, Myanmar, which is between China and India, a little tiny country. Of course, back then you would be on a boat for months in order to get there. And um, he went through incredible things there to share the gospel with those people. Um, he spent years laboring there before he saw his first convert. Um, there was a war that broke out while he was there, and so he was put in prison for 20 months and um, went through horrible sickness and suffering. Um, he Eventually, his first wife passed away. Um, as he continued to faithfully minister there, his, uh, he, they made contact with one of the native tribes there that um, actually, and they actually started to see people saved and come to Christ. Um, he spent 25 years translating the Bible into that language, the Burmese language, um, for the very first time. It was the first time they had the whole Bible in their language. So after all of that, over 30 years later, he finally comes back to the United States. And you can imagine that even back then with the communication and things like that, he had kind of become a celebrity. Um, people had heard his name, they'd, they'd seen things that he'd written, they'd heard the stories about the different things that he went through. And so wherever he went, crowds would pack in to hear him. And it wasn't before long that the crowds realized that Adoniram Judson wasn't what they expected when they went to hear him. Um, for maybe a couple different reasons, but the biggest reason was that every time that he would get up and speak, he would just get up and give the gospel. And the crowds would kind of go away unhappy, and, and the Hudson, Ta or Hudson Taylor, um, Adoniram Judson, um, started to realize that the crowd seemed dissatisfied, and he asked one of his friends, you know, what kind of was going on. And his friend said, well, they were hoping for a story. And Adoniram Judson said, I gave them a story, the most thrilling one that can be conceived of. And his friend said, well, they had heard that story before. They wanted something of a new man, something new of a man who had just come from the other side of the world. And you can imagine back then there was no TV or cell phones and people were excited to hear this person that had traveled halfway around the world and they thought surely he has exciting, exotic stories that he's going to share with us. And Adoniram Judson said that I'm glad that they have it to say that a man coming from the other side of the world had nothing better to tell than the wondrous story of Jesus' dying love. Adoniram Judson went through a lot of things, had a lot of interesting things happen to him, but at the end of the day, the one thing that he really had to share was still the dying love of Jesus. And brothers and sisters, the best thing that we have, the best thing that you have, the best part of your present reality is the dying love of Jesus. You have him. Now, if you're here this morning and you don't know him, this is, your, this is your day to turn to him and trust in him. But if you're here this morning and you do know him, just remember your tendency to forget. You forget what you were saved from, we forget who saved us, and we forget what he saved us to because we have no better identity than people who have been rescued by Jesus and who are right now loved children of God. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, I pray if there's anybody that's here this morning that does not know you, that is still actually living underneath the power of sin and Satan, I pray this morning that you would rescue them. You would open up their eyes, their need of you. And Lord, I, I pray for those of us that have been rescued. Lord, would you help us to remember? Would you bring to our mind again just how amazing our salvation really is? And that we would live lives connected to that present reality of who we really are in your son, Jesus Christ. And I pray these things in his name. Amen.